Hello and welcome to this virtual event, Women in Uniform. Does their participation shift US military culture and operations? That is the question we'll be responding to today. I'm Milan Verveer and I direct the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. And we're so pleased to be hosting this important discussion to launch new research in partnership with the Principality of Liechtenstein. Despite national policies and programs that seek to increase the number of women in the United States military, such as the Women, Peace and Security Act and the Department of Defense Implementation Plan, major participation gaps persist. In numbers alone, as of 2018, 19% of the US Army officers and 14% of enlisted Army personnel were women, with similar levels for the Navy, the Air Force, Coast Guard, and Marine Corps. This is about the meaningful participation of women. It's also about operational effectiveness. It should no longer be an option, it's a necessity because it's about improving national security policies and building partner capacity. It's about compliance with an international humanitarian law and the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security Act. And yet cultures of masculinity, sexual harassment and assault and hostile environments within the armed forces further discourage the inclusion and contributions of women. The report we are launching today, Culture, Gender and Women in the Military, Implications for the International Humanitarian Law Compliance, offers insights and recommendations for how to improve women's integration into the armed services, how to improve the military culture, compliance with international conventions that promote respect for the rule of law, for the protection of human rights, and the safety and security of civilians. You can find a link to the report in your chat box. Today's program brings together distinguished experts and military practitioners who will share their diverse perspectives on the differences women in uniform make for the US military and how they are seeing gender impact, military operations and culture. We are pleased to welcome more than 500 attendees on Zoom from over 80 countries and more who are joining us on Facebook. And I also wanna welcome His Excellency George Sparberg, Liechtenstein's new ambassador to the United States who is in our audience today. We have already received many pre-submitted questions from our audience. You can also submit questions throughout the program. Just use the Q&A feature on your computer and with your question, give us your name, your affiliation, and to whom you are directing your question. And now to our program. It is my great pleasure to introduce His Excellency Christian Wenoesser, who is the permanent representative of Liechtenstein to the United Nations, a post he has held for several years. Ambassador Wenoesser has had a very distinguished diplomatic career. Earlier, he served as president of the Assembly of States Parties of the International Criminal Court, where he chaired the special working group on crimes of aggression. And at the United Nations, he has served on several important committees and working groups. The rule of law and the protection of fundamental rights are guiding priorities in Liechtenstein's foreign policy. Ambassador Wenoesser has been deeply committed to the advancement and better application of international law and especially human rights. Liechtenstein is globally recognized for its commitment and leadership in this area. Mr. Ambassador, it's so good to have you with us. Uh, please, the floor, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, um, Milan Ambassador. Wonderful to be here. And I very much look forward to this, to this conversation. Um, you have already framed it very well. 
and talked about our priorities. So, you know, we did initiate uh, this uh, this project um, with our uh, partners at the Georgetown uh, Institute uh, against the backdrop of, of, of a longstanding commitment to two issues. One is the compliance uh, with international humanitarian law, which um, uh, has not been on a on a positive uh, trajectory for a long time, and our commitment to the Women, Peace and Security agenda established by the United Nations Security Council so so many years ago. We have increasingly placed a strong emphasis on the participation pillar, where we think uh, progress has a. Uh, has uh, not been has not been uh, sufficient, and this has led us to to initiating this program. And uh, I really want to thank our partners uh, from the Georgetown Institute um, for uh, having been such a dynamic counterpart um, uh, in this. So uh, our idea was, given the the difficulties that we continue encountering in the in the area of compliance with international humanitarian law, essentially uh, the Geneva Conventions, that we need to look at ways to increase our understanding of how these dynamic agendas correlate, namely this agenda and the Women, Peace and Security agenda to achieve their objectives. The two years research project therefore has the goal to examine the effect of the inclusion of uh, of women in military forces on uh, the respect of international uh, humanitarian law. It is uh, promising that in recent years governments have started to use the women peace and security agenda to advocate for uh, women's increased uh, participation in national militaries and we acknowledge among others certainly at the United States for remarkable steps taken to implement uh, the WPS um, agenda. And I very much look forward to uh, to listening to the conversation today and to, to hearing uh, the presentation in particular. So many thanks um, to you, many thanks uh, to, to uh, this uh, very impressive number of participants that we have with us and I look forward um, both to the conversation and obviously to continuing our uh, cooperation on this agenda. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your overview, uh, for your continuing interest and for giving us uh, your perspective and that of Liechtenstein's. Um, let us now turn to the author of the report, uh, Dr. Robert Nagel. He's a postdoctoral research fellow at our institute Prior to joining us at Georgetown, he earned his PhD in international conflict analysis at the University of Kent. He is a respected authority on conflict-related sexual violence and its consequences for international security, conflict resolution, and post-conflict stability. He won the 2019 Cedric Smith Prize for the best peace and conflict studies paper at a UK PhD, as a UK PhD student, and the Dina Zinnis Award for the International Studies Organization. He's a member of the editorial team for international peacekeeping and a member of the consultative group for the sexual violence in armed conflict data set. Rob, we're pleased to be able to turn to you now um, for an overview of the report and perhaps uh, you can give us the top highlights. Thank you so much, and thank you for the very kind introduction, um, Milan. I'm very excited to be here with you, uh, be here with everyone literally uh, across the globe um, as Charity is joining us from, uh, from Hawaii. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging and crediting uh, my fantastic co-authors, uh, Kinsey Spears and Julia Maenza, um, who've done incredible work on this project uh, with me. And as mentioned in this report, we examined the connection between gender, culture, and military conduct, especially as it relates to the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda and uh, international humanitarian law. In this report, we build on previous work supported by the Principality of Liechtenstein um, that you can also find on our website, uh, where we've looked at the, implement the connections between the Women, Peace and Security agenda and international humanitarian law. 
Our starting point for this report was uh, really the Women, Peace and Security Act um, and how the uh, US DOD, the Department of Defense, is looking to implement it through its strategic framework and implementation plan. The uh, acronym for that is SFIP. And the SFIP has three objectives um, that the DOD exemplify a diverse organization that allows women's meaningful participation across the joint force. That's number one. Number two is that women in partner nations meaningfully participate and serve at all ranks and in all occupations in defense and security sectors. Number three is that partner nation defense and security sectors ensure that women and girls are safe and secure and their human rights are protected, especially during conflict and crisis. As this makes very clear, it is at the heart of international humanitarian law. The Women, Peace and Security Agenda and how the DOD is thinking about implementing both. Um, the com for this report, we drew on interviews with current and former service members, both officers and enlisted, and an extensive review of um, reports, great literature, academic studies, and independent review um, reports. And what we find is that an entrenched masculinized military culture and an over-reliance on special operations forces as part of broader military strategy present key obstacles to women's full and equal in integration, the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and compliance with international humanitarian law. In particular, we identify three uh, intertwined and related issues that continue to impede women's progress. One, a cult of physical strength that has been fo fostered and used um, to, negate women's, uh, to negate women opportunities within the armed forces. As one interviewee said, the cult of physical strength really rose in parallel with the increase of women's opportunities in the military. You can watch these ch changes over the decades. No one is saying it out loud, but by centering physical fitness, you, you're always going to marginalize women. So that's one key issue. The second one is that there's a premium um, that the military places on cumbered arms specialties for promotions. Um, and these career paths have for a long time, um, actually until um, as recently as 2014, been uh, close to women. Um, and so that has significantly, significantly curtailed uh, women's pathways to senior leadership positions. And third, as I uh, already alluded to, the over-reliance on special operation forces, which continue to almost exclusively be men as part of a broader global US military strategy as uh, in warfare has changed um, over the last uh, 30 to 50 years. And that has important implications um, for the SFIP and uh, the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security Act, because special operation forces play a central role in building partner capacity through the US security cooperation program. So if you remember, objective two and three was really about to work with partner nations in implementing the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Um, pledging uh, to work with partner countries on equitable recruitment and deployment of women. However, if the forces, if the US forces tasked with that implementation, with building partner capacity, if these forces themselves don't have many women, very few women, or no women at all, then that um, obviously there's a disconnect between what we're um, saying we want to do and what we're actually doing. And it becomes a do what we tell you, don't do what we are doing, um, which is inherently problematic. So based on our research, um, we offer three key rec recommendations to improve uh, the implementation of the SFIP. One is uh, the, ensuring women's meaningful participation, which requires improving efforts to re recruit, retain, and promote women across all branches of the US military. And steps to achieve this have to include, or should include, I should say, um, 
revising and improving childcare policies and parental leave policies for both men and women. Because we cannot um, ask women to join the military, work in the military, deploy with the military, if we're not providing the structures, the infrastructure around that to make it possible to accommodate if both parents are serving in the military, for example. Secondly, um, or related to meaningful participation, I should uh, also uh, highlight the importance of promotion um, and leadership position for women. Because as one interviewee said to us, um, developing international law with women at the table will be different than when there aren't women at the table because they see things differently. They, their lived experience is different. The second uh, recommendation is um, that because there's such a cult of physicality, um, there needs to be better communication about what physical fitness is <laughs> and is not required for. Because there are two um, important fitness um, assessments, basically. Um, one is occupational fitness standards. So task related, what does your job require? And these sort of assessments are not gender normed, they're not age normed, it is, can you, do you, do you fulfill these requirements? Can you do the job? And unrelated to that, there are the physical fitness assessments, PFAs. These are gender and age normed because they're an assessment and an administrative tool to assess health and fitness for the overall for force. And so communicating the difference between these two is really important because men often think about PFAs and uh, therefore think uh, the physical fitness requirements for women are lower and therefore women have it easier. And that becomes part of this masculine toxic environment for women where they're not believed to be as capable as uh, men. But that's not true, especially when it comes to the occupational fitness um, standards. And third, um, part of addressing the culture has to be addressing sexual assault. The current system is broken to the extent that one of the interviewees um, that we talked to was a victim advocate herself, and she was sexually assaulted and had no faith in the system and therefore did not report her own assault. And to hear that from someone who's supposed to be in the system advocating for others is really disheartening and shows the extent to which there has to be uh, a cultural change, right? Um, and how pervasive it is. And um, as Kai has um, done a lot of work on this, I'm sure she can comment on this um, better than I can in terms of the threat it presents to national security, um, the pervasive uh, problem of sexual assault. And so our interviews stressed the need to, to end impunity for perpetrators and the need for comprehensive cultural changes. Um, based on our research, I want to stress the importance of civilian oversight, especially when it comes to special operation forces, because they are in many ways cultural norm setters internally within the US military and externally in their engagement with partner nations. I'll end here and I look forward to uh, the discussion with Kai and Charity. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rob. And that was a very cogent and clear explanation, uh, both of your findings and the recommendations stemming out of those findings. I, I wanted to ask you, um, in doing your examination of the connections that you talked about between women's participation in the military, the military culture, and compliance with international humanitarian law, uh, was there anything that you weren't able to address? Were there findings that really require greater exploration at this point? Yeah, I think um, I, while I did talk to um, some special operation forces, um, especially in the civil affairs 
uh, uh, part of uh, Special Operations Forces. Um, I didn't have the chance, uh, the opportunity to talk to the ones that are uh, more directly involved in combat. So the um, elite units, um, including the Green Berets and Navy SEALs. Uh, and I think it would be important to talk to them as well, uh, especially as they are the units that have come under some scrutiny over their conduct, both on and off the battlefield. Um, and so that is definitely an area for, for future research. Thank you. Well, you mentioned Kai. We're going to ask her to join us now, uh, adding her to this uh, panel. Uh, Dr. Kyle Ann Hunter is a U.S. Marine combat veteran and the director of the Strategy and Warfare Center and assistant professor in the Department of Military and Strategic Studies at the U U.S. Air Force Academy. She's coming to us today from Colorado. She's also an assistant adjunct professor in the Security Studies Program at Georgetown, focusing her scholarship on gender inclusion in Western militaries. She's also the vice president at Brady, working on gun violence prevention. She serves as the chair of the Employment and Integration Subcommittee of the Secretary of Defense's Advisory Committee on Women in the Services, and earlier served, on multi served multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan as an AH-1W Super Cobra attack pilot, uh, which I think is quite uh, an amazing achievement. Uh, she's also joined um, in, in being the Marine Corps Legislative Liaison Officer to the House of Representatives in our Congress and Military Liaison for the House Democracy Partnership. Kai, it's so good to have you with us. Uh, and we look for, very much forward to your comments now on this report. Uh, you are a leading expert, as we heard, on gendered politics of armed conflict. You served multiple combat deployments. Um, what impact uh, have you seen women's participation having on US military culture and operations? Um, and does it have any impact on the responsiveness to um, international humanitarian law or the Women, Peace and Security Act? Um, well, first, thank you so much for having me. This is an absolute pleasure. And uh, also want to extend my thanks to the Principality of Liechtenstein for their, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's allergy season in the fall here, right? Uh, their continued support and, and leadership leaning into both the Women, Peace and Security Act, but also to you know, international humanitarian law in general. So a huge thank you and to everyone joining us today. So when we think about women's participation and the impact that it has, I think what's really important for us to start considering is the difference between sort of counting the numbers of women and really honing in on this idea of meaningful participation that is that is there. So I think one of the things that is a, a concern that we see in the military, and we I saw this quite a bit when I was doing the work for the Independent Review Commission on Military Sexual Assault, when we look at the impact of how leaders shape climate, climate and culture, because ultimately that's the biggest thing we're looking, looking to get at here, is often, and I'm going to use the term females and women very deliberately here differently, often females, so female service members, are sort of socialized in to positions of power by adopting very masculine traits. And they're rewarded for acting essentially like men who just happen to have a different biological sex. And so when we see that happen, we actually unfortunately don't see a whole lot of positive beneficial change. And we often even see backlash occur, right? Because there's this sense that like, well, I was able to tough it out and act just like one of the guys. So everybody else should too. And that's the way we should be moving forward. However, when we start to see women being allowed to lead and serve as their authentic selves, 
we see real meaningful positive change. And I think with, with some good examples that we, we see this in, um, the Army has recently instituted a, what they call the BLOC, the, uh, the, it's the Battalion Leadership Screening Program, Screening Assessment Program that they have that doesn't just rate their potential battalion commanders and hire on you know, the, the hard skills that we typically think of as military leadership skills, right? How well can you shoot? How fast can you run? How could you do all of, all of that stuff? But they bring them out for multi-day in-person interview assessments, both with senior leaders, but more importantly, with junior soldiers who they're going to be leading to understand the ideas of social acumen, empathy, those, those people skills. And these are, these are skills that are often associated with women's socialized leadership. And so what it's doing is it's creating space to allow women and well, and everyone really, you know, cause we, we benefit when everybody gets to serve authentically and women's leadership is a, is a big benefit of that. So when we see women's, you know, women being allowed to lead as women, not having to act like little men, you know, in order to, to be successful. So when we see that, we see big positive changes. And I think we see this, and I know Charity will talk about Indopaycom. We're seeing a lot of benefits being made in Indopaycom right now, who has really leaned into promoting and rewarding this type of, of leadership right now. Um, we've seen, I think, a, a really good example of this is actually um, the recent retirement of Major General Tammy Smith from the Army, who ended up serving as a uh, you know, one of their chief personnel officers who not only served authentically as a woman, but as a gay woman, which is, you know, adding that additional part of her life since the post repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And she was able to fundamentally bring in changes to the personnel system because she had that space for authenticity. And I think when you see that space, you see a better adherence to international humanitarian law, primarily because you allow for a multitude of perspectives to be brought into the security conversation. You know, when we reward just one type of leadership, which is that very masculine culture of leadership that we're used to in the military, we end up having one security perspective. When we have one security perspective, it's much easier to skirt some key tenets of humanitarian law because we don't see human security. We don't see the, the people side, the participation and protection of people as part of security, we just see, am I getting shot by bad guys as, as part of that? So, so I think when we see meaningful participation of women, when we have the incentive structures that allow for empathy, human connection, social acumen to be key tenets of leadership, we've seen great, great positive change. But when we force female service members to act like men, we aren't doing any favors. So I think that's our, our key as we're talking about increasing numbers, we simultaneously need to be tweaking our leadership incentive structures so that we get the positive benefits that we see that, you know, we've seen from women's leadership in so many other sectors in the security force, you know, state department with your, with your work and across USAID and, and, um, a lot of our more, you know, diplomacy, intelligence, economic sides of, of dime there. And if we can capture those lessons and really institute them in how we reward military leadership, I think we'll see great positive change. Wonderful, wonderful comments and a lot to uh, uh, continue the conversation on. We're going to move uh, now to Charity Borg, uh, who is the Women, Peace and Security Planner with the US Indo-Pacific Command. Uh, she's in their Office of Women, Peace and Security. Uh, she's coming to us from Hawaii. Uh, she's a US Air Force veteran uh, while on active duty and a reserve officer in the US Air Force. She served in numerous positions from program manager, department director, uh, director of protocol for the combined joint task force, Horn of Africa. She also served with the Pacific Air Forces as the senior military protocol advisor to the four-star commander, a position in which she garnered extensive experience with the Indo-Pacific defense and security leaders. <coughs> Excuse me. She's a graduate of the Air Force Academy, 
and has a master's from Northeastern University. Charity, it's great having you with us today as well. Uh, you have had the responsibility, you continue to have, of implementing uh, gender sensitive policies. Um, I know it's a difficult task having tried to do some of that at the State Department. Um, can you tell us what difference these policies have made um, and what gender policies in your experience and what you have done have been successfully implemented across the US Indo-Pacific uh, Command? And maybe you wanna throw into your answer uh, what some of those challenges have been. But we'll take the good news and the best, best uh, outcomes uh, if you, if you don't mind, since we need that kind of uplift. Thanks, Charity. Absolutely. And uh, thank you, Ambassador, for the question and for having me on this panel alongside such an incredible group of professionals. Um, so to start, I would say that the ability for DOD personnel to integrate gender perspectives into military plans, programs, policies, and partner engagements starts with senior leader buy-in and prioritization. Fortunately, at Indopaycom, we've had really a continued succession of senior leaders who recognize that WPS is a national security imperative and that it's crucial to ensuring a free and open Indo-Pacific. However, the reality is it is a small minority of the joint force that is aware of WPS, let alone its mandate and relevance to the DOD so the socialization and education of staff is a daily challenge uh, for our team here. So Indo-PACOM has been at the forefront of WPS integration in the DOD. And after the passing of the WPS Act in 2017, our PACOM commander at the time signed the DOD's first command instruction mandating the implementation of WPS by all directorates and subordinate commands in the Indo-Pacific. So in 2018, uh, after the DOD ran its first Operational Military Agenda Advisor course, Indo-PACOM was focused on resourcing, and in 2019, hired its first full-time command gender advisor, and from there, built out an entire office of women, peace, and security. Through gender focal point training and gender advisor courses, you know, we've been educating and training our own personnel to understand WPS, not just as a program, but as a learned and applied capability that is cross-cutting and wide-ranging, touching upon almost every issue that deals with the human population. So our trained personnel recognize gender as a key characteristic of the operational environment and use this knowledge to inform mission planning and to build partner capacity to respect and advance human rights, equality under the law, and equal access to aid in crisis. Due to these efforts, we have over 120 active gender advisors and gender focal points across the Indo-PACOM staff and subordinate commands that are implementing the DOD SBIP objectives in their respective functional areas. The impact of all these actions is that we're fundamentally changing the way US security practitioners think about and develop inclusive security strategies. One of the many great examples I can share on how our command is how our command gender advisor at United States Army Pacific, Lieutenant Colonel Eric Slater, um, first drove the implementation of WPS into the command's regional disaster response exercise exchange program, starting with Exercise Gobi Wolf in Mongolia in 2018. The exercise included a women's mentorship program to highlight the significance of applying a gender perspective both in steady state and emergency operations, and it now runs annually in all of our regional DREES. The program consisted of roughly two dozen women from defense and law enforcement organizations and supported three important outcomes for the Mongolian Air Force, Armed Forces, I'm sorry. It leveraged best practices outlined in UNSCR 1325 by integrating women in defense and security sector decision-making and examining relevant laws policies and accountability mechanisms that enable women's participation in the Mongolian Armed Forces. Second, it equipped women in the defense and security sector with knowledge and tools required to address the needs of women and other vulnerable populations in Mongolian disaster response, mitigation, and management efforts. 
And third, it leveraged women's networks to strengthen relationships across the Mongolian security and disaster response agencies and civil society to facilitate interagency coordination and increase and identify gender-based issues during disaster response efforts. Second, the second program, a part of the exercise that was added was a rural women's change makers program. In addition to the women's mentorship program, this focused on engaging local civil society organizations and conducted a two week leadership training for rural Mongolian women. This training was designed to build human capacity in rural areas and prepare female participants to access leadership and leadership roles and help them identify solutions to local gender issues within their communities. This program resulted in significant tangible benefits for um, Mongolian women um, and disaster response efforts at large. So there are so many things I could continue to share to include how three of our uh, members of Office of Women, Peace and Security and Operational Gender Advisors are currently supporting NORTHCOM with Operation Allies Welcome and serving as Joint Task Force Gender Advisors, helping commanders address a wide variety of gender-based challenges in the Afghan refugee camps. However, <laughs> I know I need to, to render my time. Um, so thank you again for the question. Well, thank you so much for that very positive uh, uh, set of experiences. Uh, but also, you know, both you and Rob did underscore how important senior leader buy-in is. And I think that's an important lesson coming out of this because clearly you've seen that uh, play out in spades uh, in, in your own work. We're gonna do one quick round with everybody, um, basically focused on recommendations uh, that you have to make. And then we're gonna go to audience questions. Uh, so Rob, let me start with you. You had uh, noted some of the recommendations coming out of uh, your report. What is it going to take to implement those recommendations? Because that's always the tough part. Uh, what are we going to have to see uh, in terms of buy-in uh, across the various levels of the U.S. government? Yeah, that's the critical question. And I think um, it's budgeting, it's resources, it is, um, you know, we can, uh, it's, if you want to see someone's priorities, ask them to show you, show them their budget, um, because that's, the money talks, um, basically. And so I think that's the, that's the key um, point. Um, so I'll keep it concise because uh, I know we're already short on time and uh, we have more questions for uh, Kai and Charity. All right, I'll, I'll go uh, next to Kai. Kai, what are some of those best practices? We're always interested in the practices that are working someplace uh, because it tells us a great deal of potentially what's replicable uh, and what can be scaled. Uh, so what best practices have you seen and what recommendations uh, would you put forward for us uh, in terms of, of increasing compliance with the international humanitarian law in military operations? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, to, to Rob's point, budget is always sort of where we need to go. So I think I'll, I'll frame this sort of from the lens of best practices that elevate this topic to the sort of key high operational levels that can force budgeting mechanisms, you know, to, to actually put more money behind it. So I think one of the, the first and foremost is to treat things like the prevention of sexual assault, the prevention of interpersonal violence, the um, increase of empathy and social acumen as operational issues in a unit, not women's issues in the unit. If these things are directed, tracked, and led by the operational aspects of whether it's a squadron, a battalion, a division, whatever it is, you know, what happens in the operations shop in a unit really is what drives budget resources and time. So I think some of the best practices that that we've seen is when we look at compliances, not just as, okay, well, these are women's issues, things that we'll do after the operations, but key operational ideas. And so some, some ways to actually do that concretely, 
are, you know, Charity mentioned some of the exercises that are done. This is really important that as you are planning military training exercises, that A, you're looking at your plans and operations, who's involved in making them, whose perspectives are there, whose perspectives aren't there, and how are we defining security and security outcomes? So really bringing that WPS perspective to your operational design when you're doing training exercises is one very concrete way. And we've seen, you know, Indopaycom really is, is the leader in this. The next real important best practice, and we're starting to see this happen quite a bit at Marine Corps University, but is for the more senior, the command and staff level primary military education institutions, PME schools, they all have big wargaming activities that go on as sort of a culmination of their command and staff experiences. And Marine Corps University has started incorporating gender, gendered security, WPS, and women's meaningful participation, both internally and among partner nations, as a key component of success in those war games. And what that does is in this environment, it gives these future commanders, you know, so everyone who's at these schools are getting ready to go be commanders, a real operational understanding of what WPS is in a way that you can't get just from reading a book, right? So we talk about education more and education is important, but giving them that practical application allows for an understanding of what the operational side of this is. Because if we think about how to get budgets into the DOD to prioritize this, budgets go to what is operationally effective. You know, that that's how sort of budgets get requested, budget gets, gets driven. So I think this is a very concrete best practice that can elevate women's participation into that operational side to start getting a broader budget and replicating some of these, you know, these successes that Charity talked about when we see them, you know, operated in these pockets, but really institutionalize it across the DOD. Yeah, that's so important because what we hear all the time on these issues is how do they contribute to operational effectiveness? Uh, and I think the example that you gave about uh, really rooting this in the training at that level sends a message, this is important and it is important uh, to our operations overall. So it's not something marginal. So let's go back to you, Charity, before we go to our audience. Um, you you uh, gave us some very positive uh, examples earlier, uh, but I wonder if you could um, give us a couple of recommendations uh, for WPS implementation uh, across uh, the military. Um, you know, you gave us those examples from Mongolia. I wonder if you could give us some uh, general recommendations for how we might do this job more successfully. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. So first and foremost, institutionalization. Um, so with a bureaucracy as large as the DOD that comprises of over 2 million active duty reserve and civilian uh, workforce, um, it is going to take significant investment um, to shift the way we do business. Uh, so there is a network of full-time gender advisors um, that are working tirelessly in the end of in uh, the DOD to really integrate gender perspectives into all the relevant plans, uh, policies, also while educating the joint force, also while implementing WPS security cooperation with uh, partner nations. Um, that network um, is in total uh, between the full-time and part-time personnel, only 400 people um, in the entire DOD um, because simply there's not enough resourcing um, to uh, expand uh, the capacity um, and train at a more rapid rate. Um, additionally, really the majority of those personnel are contract personnel, which inherently means that they lack government authority. Um, and really a, a small minority of those are government employees at this time. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, it's really gonna require continued and increased uh, financial investment. Um, both for personnel, but also for uh, security cooperation activities. Um, so we can really get at, at uh, continuing to expand um, that partnership capacity building focused on human security. Um, so second, I, I know uh, Dr. Hunter talked on this uh, already a little bit um, uh, through the professional military education uh, line of effort. 
but I think it's really important that we develop both male and female uh, members of the Department of Defense to consider gender perspectives in both operational planning and leadership decision making. Um, so one of the ways that our senior leaders have supported getting after that at US Indo-PACOM has been through um, driving the inclusion of different perspectives in, in their leadership development program. And what I mean by that is it would be surprising for most to see on a reading list for professional military uh, education uh, of sorts in the DOD to have books like Dr. Brene Brown, Dare to Lead, and uh, The Good Guys uh, by Dr. Dave Smith that gets after you know, men being uh, allies to women in the workplace and really highlighting the um, unseen but lived experiences of women in the Department of Defense and helps get after our Defense Objective One and the challenges that we see there. Um, so I won't get into kind of that recommendation anymore. But lastly, you know, I want to comment on one of the policy recommendations that's cited in the report related to ending the impunity for sexual misconduct. You know, in, in my experience, that culture of impunity for sexual misconduct poses one of the largest deterrents for women entering the armed services, as well as one of the most significant reasons women leave. So for too long, I think the DOD has approached preventing sexual assault um, by addressing the symptoms and not the problem. Um, these measures have included, you know, things such as crack, cracking down on the discipline for things like underage drinking, which, you know, is a civilian equivalent of a misdemeanor <laughs> because, you know, statistics show that the majority of assault cases in, involve alcohol. Instead of prioritizing the discipline of serving sexual predators who have assaulted fellow service members, a felony under U.S. law. So until military commanders enforce the full measure of the UCMJ to protect both women and men from sexual violence, this cycle is going to continue at alarming rates. Um, and we're still going to continue to see, you know, um, our, our military forces uh, looking at uh, composition of only 20 percent. Um, I also want to caution, actually, against um, assigning any sort of readiness metric around units with uh, sexual assault, um, because I think there's a bit of a misnomer with reporting, in particular because reporting, especially unrestricted, signals both trust in the command um, to take care of them as an individual, but also hold perpetrators accountable. Um, but we can sometimes see leaders think that, you know, we're seeing more sexual assault cases, the command must be doing something wrong. No, you're, you're actually getting informed about them because people trust you and are giving you the opportunity to do something about it. So commanders should be rather measured by what they do or don't do when those reports come forward and be swiftly held accountable um, for inaction, inaction. Thank you. I'm glad your points are all well taken. I, I think the one about the gender advisors, really, they, they can't be marginalized. They've got to be uh, really working with the top leadership. Uh, so that needs major improvement. But the sexual violence piece uh, is certainly uh, an extraordinarily important uh, issue that has to be dealt with. And Kai, I know you've done a lot of work in this space. Maybe you can quickly add whatever uh, you want to add, and then we'll go to the audience. Yeah, thank you, absolutely. I just uh, recently finished up um, co-chairing the climate and culture line of effort for the Independent Review Commission on Military Sexual Assault. And I think, you know, when we talk about this in relation to really the operational side of things, I think one of our, our biggest things that, that we found, and this was out over, you know, a thousand hours worth of, of interviews um, and work with over um, you know, 1,300 and enlisted service members, but also over a hundred commanders throughout the time here is looking at the difference between individual trust and institutional trust. That's a problem. We look at what we actually have to fix and change. And we found that from an individual level, there's actually quite a bit of trust between service members and their direct commanders or the, the folks who are directly in charge of them, especially even their senior enlisted leaders. So not commanders who are in decision-making, but those in their chain that they trust. But there's no systemic trust. There's no trust that the process actually works. 
So when we look at key things we have to fix, I think it really is this two prong. We have to talk about the leadership and we've talked a lot about how that's important in getting the right people in the job. But there are key systemic procedural issues that we need to, to fix and uh, invest in. Um, and, and really like, and really focus on in order to rebuild that trust that's there. And so that's where I think some of Rob's recommendations around oversight is really important. But beyond that, when we start talking about, and this ties directly to the humanitarian law side, one of our, our biggest findings too, was that the, the judge advocate core that's there is not trained to handle issues of gender-based or sexual violence, whether that is internal, and that leads to a lot of issues among sexual violence internally, or even externally. So I think addressing this issue procedurally, and when we talk about oversight, we have to talk about training of the folks who are asking to do these things and training them deliberately on special victim cases, gender-based violence, you know, interpersonal violence in a way that most aren't. You know, they're they're trained on targeting, you know, like how to how to pick targets, or they're trained on, you know, compliance with personnel policies to make sure we're not laundering money, right? Between dependents. Like that's that's really where their training is. Giving our 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 judge advocates this very deliberate training on special victims crimes and interpersonal gender-based violence is going to not only help and impact and build trust among service members with regards to sexual assault, but will provide a, a real strong foundation for greater compliance with international humanitarian law as well. So I think that's one of those big structural um, structural aspects we need to look at when we talk about oversight. We need to be careful. It's not just let's pull things away from commanders, but let's give the correct deliberate tools to ensure that we're getting the maximum benefits from the folks that we're actually entrusting to do this work. Excellent, thank you. We'll turn now to Ali Smith, who's going to uh, give us some of the questions from our audience, as much time as we have. Sure, two related questions here. First one is from Colonel Catherine Kimball Ayers, commandant for the School of Medicine at the Uniformed Services University. And her question, and it, it seems maybe Rob, you can answer this, is were you able to stratify the data at all by the different corps and areas of the military that might have a higher percentage of women? to see if there are different perceptions and experiences? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. And um, so while I did talk to a JAG officer, he was a man, um, but I talked, uh, I asked him about sort of the proportion uh, of JAG office, officers that he's interacted with uh, who are women, and he put that around 25%. And uh, so I asked him like, were there differences in what you observed in terms of, we talked about um, targeting decisions for airstrikes and um, the process and the recommendations and um, the sort of informal policy at the time of um, considering all men of a certain age as combatants. Uh, and he said the only JAG he ever saw visibly uh, like struggle with that uh, informal policy uh, was a woman. Um, but he didn't want to extra extrapolate from that. Um, I certainly don't want to, but he, he again emphasized that di the differences in terms of experiences uh, um, are probably Im important in shaping decisions, uh, in shaping advice for those um, making these kind of um, targeting decisions. So, um, and I think a second question in terms of um, sample was in terms of active component and reserve component. If I can just briefly address that question from the Q&A, I saw um, all everyone I talked to was active or for, uh, formerly active. And so I think there is um, probably a big difference in attitudes um, in between reserve and active that uh, should, certainly is um, can be explored in future research. I'll stop here. Right. Allie, back to you. Yeah, this one is from Michael Fazio, a student at the National War College, asking for your specific recommendations for men in uniform that wish to fight the gendered perception of the military and who want to help shepherd a military culture more inclusive to women. Great question. Who wants to answer? Kai, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think, 
sort of two prong. One is you deliberately mentor people who don't look like you. I think when we talk about mentorship, especially if you're in a, a leadership position, there's a tendency to gravitate towards people who are like, oh, I see myself in them, right? They could have been me 10 years ago type thing. So first and foremost, be very deliberate about seeking out people who look different than you to bring along and, and mentor. That's one of the best things that you can you can do to foster that, that culture of, of inclusivity. And then second, I think is to, especially as a man, elevate empathy and that social acumen in your own leadership, because you're going to be looked at by other junior men. And if they see you modeling it, that is absolutely key to see that this is, this is okay. And this is an appropriate way to lead. Charity, did you want to add to that at all? Absolutely. Um, I think it's really important um, that men uh, take the initiative to be not passive, uh, but active allies of women in the workplace. Um, so, you know, when you're seeing uh, that person make the inappropriate joke, um, that you express your own personal conviction and, and problem with, you know, sexualizing uh, the workplace. And don't put that onus um, either on women <laughs> in your workplace um, or because they are there. Um, own uh, your problem with uh, that sort of environment. Um, and again, I'll, I'll give a plug because there's just really so many uh, recommendations in um, Dr. Dave Smith's uh, book, uh, The Good Guys that really gets after how, how men, you know, strategies of how men can be those active allies and, and agents for uh, cultural change um, and, and promoting a work environment that is inclusive <laughs> and gets after the meaningful participation aspect. Great. We have just a couple minutes left at most, so we'll take one more and have to close after that. Sure, uh, a rather large question, so we'll see what we can cover. They're asking if you could speak a bit on the application of today's conversation to emerging security priorities, including strategic competition, climate change, space, technology, et cetera. How can WPS and IHL be best incorporated into these areas? Big question, but important question. Kai, go ahead. So I'll give I'll just give one sort of soundbite answer because I know we've got a lot of people who can can have this and I'll talk about the strategic competition side of this with WPS. If we look right now with strategic competition, particularly China and Russia, they are focused on what they refer to as masculinization campaigns. I think we've all seen the like horrific coverage of these things, right? That they're saying our militaries are going to be more masculine and those soft U.S. people, right? That that's you know. That's my overdramatication of it there, right? But what that actually means is they're focused on a very narrow monolithic view of security based on what they're doing. And if we look at our strategic advantage, it is actually fully embracing WPS because it allows for a broad, holistic, I'm going to say both offensive and defensive ability in security. And that doesn't mean offensively just going and dropping bombs, but being able to project a positive view of security in a way to rebuild alliances and trust that have been broken over the past several years. And uh, you know, actually promote what the benefits of diverse democracy are in a very real way. So I think when we look at strategic competition, that's actually how we counter these masculinization campaigns isn't becoming more like China and Russia, but actually harnessing this holistic view of security. Comprehensive view of security, to be sure. Rob, do you want to add anything? I think um, just one piece of it, uh, and uh, we talked about this before we went live, uh, it's the intersection with climate uh, change and the um, really bringing together the women, peace and security and climate crisis, um, because there are there's such an overlap in how these issues really are strategic um, issue in terms of uh, national security. So, and I know uh, if we had enough time, um, Charity could probably uh, speak to that as well. Um, in because it's in in the indo pacom region in particular uh, where we see these sort of converging influences. 
So Charity, we'll give you the last word. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll keep it this simplistic. There's 50% of the population that has been historically left out of um, developing security solutions um, for everything from climate change to gender-based violence to um, countering violent extremism to HADR. Um, and that when we bring the other half of that talent um, and that really just work power and perspective to the table, we save lives, time, and money. Um, and that is how we win in the competition space. Um, and we take care of people and build more secure and resilient societies. Well, thank you for that. that I think that's an excellent way to uh, have to come to a close today that when we shortchange women in the military and their meaningful participation, we shortchange our military effectiveness, we shortchange our security overall. This has been an extremely important conversation. We've only scratched the surface, uh, but we're so pleased to have had uh, all of you with us, um, Dr. Nagel, Dr. Hunter, uh, Ms. Borg, and Ambassador uh, Winnewesser. Uh, I hope we will continue to do more work in this space because it's vi vitally needed for all the reasons that, that all of you, each of you put forward today. So thank you and continue your efforts uh, because it matters greatly. Bye.